This is an MJA Inc. Investigations Warning. This MJA podcast is rated E for explicit. Some details of a case and language used on this podcast might be upsetting to some of our listeners. Listener's discretion is advised. And for those who are still with us, kick back and enjoy the show. Welcome to our MJ podcast, the series on solved crimes, episode 11, part 6. Four New Mexico unsolved homicide cold cases. Uncovered news. We are changing the narrative around cold cases and New Mexico murders through a collective impact. Please join us. We believe the more resources we can provide to digital volunteers and citizen solvers mean more citizen detective communities. According to Project Cold Case, there were around 6,579 homicides in New Mexico between 1980 and 2019. Around 4,302 of those murders have since been solved. But there are currently around 2,277 unsolved murders in New Mexico. Hello everyone, my name is Mark and I will be your host for tonight's show. Joining me later will be our amazing co-host, Olivia. We will profile four New Mexico unsolved homicide cold cases. We are coming to you from Winter Paradise, located in Hudson, Florida. Welcome to New Mexico. Four unsolved homicide cold cases. Victim 1. On October 5, 1980, an unidentified white female's nude body was discovered laying face down by two men who pulled off of State Route 146 outside of Henderson, New Mexico. 
the unidentified female was named Jane Arrero Grande Doe, who wasn't identified until November 10th, 2021. Victim 2 on May 7, 1988, 21-year-old Steve Sandlin, who was a rookie police officer for Mountain Air, New Mexico, was working alone in the police station when he was found shot and he died a few minutes later. Victim 3 in July 1989, 18-year-old Caitlin Arquette, a white female, after leaving her parents' home en route to a new girlfriend's house, was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Victim 4 on August 25, 1994, Wells Fargo Armored Guard 28-year-old Jeff Ulcher was shot and killed during an attempted robbery on Highway 6 outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, Olivia will be on the line. We will profile four unsolved homicide cold cases from the state of New Mexico. Be back in a moment. Welcome to our MJ podcast, this series, Unsolved Crimes. This is episode 11, part 6, for New Mexico Unsolved Homicide Cold Cases. We have our amazing co-host, Olivia, on the line. How are you doing tonight? Doing well. How are you? All right. And let's carry on and dig into these unsolved cases. Welcome to New Mexico. Four New Mexico unsolved homicide cold cases. Victim one. Welcome to Henderson, New Mexico. Unsolved homicide. On October 5, 1980, an unidentified white female was discovered laying face down by two men who had pulled over off of State Route 146 near Old Lake Mead Drive and Arrero Grande Boulevard outside of Henderson, New Mexico. The unidentified female was given the name Jane Arrero Grande Doe. Henderson Police Detective John Williams was assigned to the case. Detective Williams reported few leads gathered. Evidence that showed the unidentified female was bashed on the head with a hammer and stabbed in the back. Jane Arrero Grande Doe had a homemade S tattoo on her right forearm, but that did not advance the case. Having a nameless victim hinders the investigation as trying to find a possible suspect or a motive for the killing. The case went cold. Now let's turn the page. In 2003, Jane Arrero Grande Doe's body was exhumed to compare dental records after a detective in Sparks uncovered the case of a missing girl who looked a lot like her but it was not the missing girl he was looking for. Clark County Coroner Michael Murphy reported that his office had taken x-rays, fingerprints, and dental samples from Jane Arrero Grande Doe, but even then, they hit a wall. Detective Williams retired in 2006, and the case was turned over to Henderson Detective Joseph, Joseph Ebert. Detective Williams always knew that someday they would ID Jane Arrero Grande Doe, so Williams stayed on, even being retired, to assist Detective Ebert. The case received additional attention in 2015, which was the 35th anniversary of Jane Arrero Grande Doe's death. 
Williams and Ebert, the detective who took over the investigation, visited the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that year, and that generated more movement on the case. On November 10, 2021, the female homicide victim was ID'd as 17-year-old Tammy Corinne Terrell. This ID was made through analysis of DNA recovered at the crime. Detective Williams and Detective Ebert's efforts had finally paid off. There were several organizations, including the FBI, Firebird Forensics Group, Gene by Gene, had aided the investigators over the years. The DNA of two of Tammy's sisters helped put a name to the body of Jane Arrero Grande Doe. Seventeen-year-old Tammy Corinne Terrell was from Roswell, New Mexico. Since Terrell's ID, it has been learned by police that the 17-year-old Terrell was last seen alive in Ros at a Roswell restaurant a week before she was discovered dead. Tammy Terrell was with an unidentified man and an unknown woman following a state fair. They are considered people of interest in the case. The job is only half done. The police still need to find Tammy Terrell's killers and bring them to justice. Anyone with info concerning this case, please contact the Henderson Police Department at 702-267-4750. To remain anonymous, contact Crime Stoppers at 702-385-5555. Victim 2. Welcome to Mountain Air, New Mexico. Unsolved Homicide. On May 7, 1988, 21-year-old Steve Sandlin, who was a rookie police officer from Mountain Air, New Mexico Police Department, was working alone in the police station when he was found shot. Police Chief David Carson and several other officers arrived at, arrived at the scene soon after. They found a 21-year-old Sandlin lying on the ground with his gun next to him. Blood stains were found around him. Chief Carson asked the rookie police officer what had happened, but the 21-year-old Sandlin was unresponsive. An ambulance was called and EMTs began working to try to save Sandlin's life. Sadly, rookie officer Sandlin died soon after. 21-year-old Sandlin had been on the force for just eight weeks. Steve Sandlin's gun was found by his side. Authorities believe that the fatal bullet may have come from his weapon. The main manner of death, at first, thought to be accidental or suicide. However, Sandlin's family did not believe this, and they became convinced that he was murdered, possibly as a result of a conspiracy. A one-time assistant attorney general also believed that Sandlin was murdered, noting that there was no evidence of suicide or an accident. The most controversial allegation regarding the case was that the identity of his killer was deliberately covered up by law enforcement officials. Mountaineer, New Mexico was an isolated community and was known to be a center for the cultivation of marijuana. Despite this town's police department consisted of only four men, Steve Sandlin had told his father, Tom, that things at the job were not like how he thought they would be and that something was wrong. However, the 21-year-old Sandlin did not elaborate on what was exactly wrong. The last person to talk to Steve before his death was his girlfriend, Michelle. The two were making plans for the next day. During their conversation, Sandlin told her that Chief Carson had yelled at him about writing so many traffic tickets and ordered him to go back to the police station. Around 45 minutes later at 7.45, Chief Carson received word that Steve had been shot. When Chief Carson examined the scene, he found no evidence of confrontation or of other shots fired. Chief Carson suspected that if the death was not a suicide, then it was accidental. The results of rookie officer Steve Sandlin's autopsy were inconclusive. Some believe that the gun may have been as much as two feet away from Sandlin's head when it was fired, an unusual distance for a self-inflicted wound. Secondly, there were only insignificant traces of gunpowder found on his hand an unusually small amount if he had fired the fatal shot. Authorities noted that evidence at the scene suggested that Steve Sandlin's body had been moved. 
Although the 21-year-old Sandlin had been shot on the right side of the head, fragments, blood, and other matter were found on the wall to the right of his body. 1989, the Attorney General's office asked the Los, Al Los Alamos National Laboratory for help examining the case. Lab scientists determined that Sandlin was ducking away from his gun when he was shot. Also, other injuries to Sandlin's face were inconsistent with suicide or accidental. In May 1995, Sandlin's case was officially classified as a homicide, and he was listed as slain in the line of duty. On the night of April 11, 1988, just one month before Sandlin's death, he arrested a local resident and made an important discovery, a large bag of marijuana on the car floor. The following day, a warrant was obtained and the resident's home was searched. 54 pounds of marijuana was discovered with a street value close to $100,000. Within days of the arrest, rookie officer Steve Sandlin received death threats. Sandlin was unable to trace the death threats, but several other officers received threats after arrest arresting local drug dealers. During this time, the New Mexico Attorney General's office was investigating reports that the Mountaineer police had carelessly handled evidence. Steve Sandlin had been questioned by investigators the day before his death. After Steve Sandlin's death, his house was searched by law enforcement. Three days later, his family arrived in Mountain Air to collect Steve Sandlin's belongings. In the, in the kitchen, a family member opened a drawer which contained several bags of marijuana. They could not understand how it's, the authorities missed it during their search as it was not well hidden. Chief Carson believed that someone planted it there to make Sandlin and the police department look bad. Several questions remain in the death of rookie police officer Steve Sandlin, including one, if the 21-year-old police officer was murdered, why was he killed inside the police station? Two, why was marijuana discovered in Sandlin's house after a thorough police search? Three, do his fellow officers know more than they are telling him about Sandlin's death? Suspects, Mountaineer police officers are considered potential suspects in Steve Sandlin's death. Another suspect in the case is Melvin King, who died in 2004. King was a local resident. Sandlin arrested a few weeks before his death on the marijuana charge. Another strange twist to the homicide case, the marijuana confiscated from King's home later went missing from the police department's evidence room. The charges against King were dismissed in November 1988. King denied any involvement in Sandlin's death. Chief Carson was also in question as a suspect, but he took polygraph with the FBI and passed. A soldier on leave and a friend of Chief Carson's son is, one, is the one who found Sandlin's body. When questioned by an Army investigator, a soldier claimed that he would go to jail if he told the truth. The Army investigator believed that the soldier was withholding information. Another strange twist in the case was investigators learned that a police officer from another agency had allegedly confessed to killing Sandlin. It is not known if any further follow-up occurred regarding the so-called confession. Five months after Sandlin's death, an Albuquerque police officer told investigators he had been tipped off that an officer was going to be killed by drug dealers. It is not known if the information was ever followed up on. In May 2019, Mountaineer New Mexico Police Department dedicated its renovated police station to Steve Sandlin, naming the police station the Stephen A. Sandlin Memorial Police Station. The case remains unsolved. If you have any info concerning this case, please contact the New Mexico FBI branch office. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, we will profile two more unsolved homicide cold cases. Be back in a moment. <clears throat> Welcome to our MJ podcast, this series, Unsolved Crimes. This is episode 11, part 6, for New Mexico Unsolved Homicide Cold Cases. Victim 3. Welcome to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Unsolved Homicide. Who killed Kate Arquette? Is an Albuquerque team's 1989 slain unsolved due to a police cover-up. On July 16, 1989, 18-year-old Caitlin Arquette, after leaving her parents' home en route to 
Sharon Smith's house a new girlfriend is when Caitlin Arquette was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The 18-year-old Arquette, while driving, was chased down on Lomos Street and shot twice in the head at a stoplight at the corner of Lomos and John Street. Arquette's car crossed the medium and came to rest on the sidewalk east of the intersection on Lomos and Arno Street. Albuquerque police ruled the deadly shooting as a random drive-by and refused to investigate other possibilities. Kate's family believes the 18-year-old was killed because she was a potential whistleblower. In the months directly before her murder, Kate Arquette was in position to have gained information about a number of illegal activities involving dangerous and corrupt individuals. Among, among those activities were the following. The Asian crime in New Mexico and California. Drug smuggling. Drug activities involving New Mexico VIP. And police corruption. The crime scene. The first officer at the scene, a violent crimes detective, observed two vehicles parked on the sidewalk. Kate's Red Ford Tempo and a second vehicle, a VW Bug. The detective also saw a man he was later identified standing next to Kate's car. It was then that the detective discovered an unconscious, blood-drenched girl laying across both front seats of the Ford. Another officer arrived at the scene and took one look at the bullet shattered driver's window and recognized that it was a crime scene which they radioed the station for backup. The 18 year old Kate Arquette survived 20 hours in a coma and died the next evening. The two officers didn't take any information from the identified man at the scene other than his name and an incorrect phone number. To this day, no police officer has ever interviewed this identified man who was at the scene when police arrived. There are so many contradictory accounts of the scene that all anybody seems to know for certain is 18-year-old Arquette ended up with two bullet holes in her head. There is no physical evidence, there is no exit wound, and the bullets were not found in her body. There was also a bullet hole in the door frame of her car. That bullet was never found either. Now think about it. How's that even possible? What was found on the floor of the car was a handwritten directions to a house. Please use the handwritten directions that they found on the floor of Kate's car, which led them to Sharon Smith's house. Sharon Smith told police that Kate arrived at her home at 9.30 p.m. and left her home around 10.45 p.m. driving east on Lomos Boulevard. Kate had been telling people that she was breaking up with her live-in Vietnamese boyfriend, that if he called trying to find her, not to say where she was at. During Sharon Smith's phone conversation with Kate's mother, she claimed that Kate had Sharon to phone her apartment over and over again to see if her boyfriend was there. Kate, Kate did not want to speak to him, she just wanted to nail down his whereabouts. Smith claims that there was never an answer. Sharon Smith dialed the apartment for the final time at 10.40 p.m. and there was still no answer. The day after the shooting, one of Kate's friends informed Kate's family that Kate's boyfriend was a member of an organized crime ring that Kate was in position to expose. It seems that Kate's live-in boyfriend had public officials in his pockets with other crime family connections. Kate's boyfriend produced an alibi that was never verified and is in conflict with Sharon Smith's statements that Kate's boyfriend was not at home to respond to the 10.40 p.m. phone call. Sharon Smith told Kate's mother that she is certain that the Vietnamese killed Kate.
Sharon Smith has fled New Mexico in fear of her own life. Here are some of the questions from the Arquette family. Question one, why would Sharon Smith give conflicting stories about Kate's arrival time? Two, when did Kate really get to Sharon's house? Question three, why did Sharon phone Kate's mother in an attempt to establish the story that Kate came to her home straight from the 5 p.m. movie? Question four, what was Kate's what was Kate really doing between 6.15 p.m. and when she left her parents' house to 10.50 p.m. when she was shot to death in her car? Other conflict, conflicting reports. The medics with the Albuquerque ambulance who transported Kate to the hospital have stated in individual affidavits that when they responded to the routine call to find no cops, no police cars, and no bystanders. They just found Kate alone in her car, unconscious and bleeding from two head wounds. The two officers on the scene reports indicate they were there when the rescue arrived. The medical team has stated that they almost missed the scene because there was no police cars and there was nobody to wave them over. Police say the location of the shooting was defined by a large pile of broken glass at Lomos and John Street. However, there is nothing to document the existence of the broken glass. It was not gathered up as evidence, and it, it wasn't photographed. The Arcat family and their investigators speculate that the crime scene may have been altered before investigators got there. Albuquerque Police Department's forensic unit arrived late because they had been at a police shooting. It should be noted that the detective of the forensic unit met at the scene was a rogue cop who partied at a chop shop on Arno Street, one half block north of the crime scene. He has since been fired by the Albuquerque Police Department for burglarizing a liquor store while on duty. Since the bullets and casings were never found, there was no way to determine if the small caliber bullets that shattered Kate's head were the same caliber bullet that struck the door frame of her car. The size of the hole in the door frame seems to suggest otherwise. A second opinion. In 2003, after receiving copies of the Albuquerque Police Department reports, forensic reports, scene photos, and etc., a member of a county cold case squad came up with the following interpretation of the crime scene. On the basis of the review of available material in the matter of the death of Caitlin Arquette, the following observations are made. One, there was not, this was not a random drive-by shooting. Two, the shooting occurred after Caitlin's vehicle had struck the utility pole. 3. The accuracy of the shots suggests they were fired at very close range and at a non-moving target. 4. Had the shooting taken place while the victim's car was in motion, it would have been it would have veered to the right of the roadway due to the left-right chamber of the pavement. Also, the victims falling to the right would have turned the steering wheel in that direction if she was grasping the steering wheel at the time of the shooting. 5. Damage to the left end of the rear bumper suggests the rear of her vehicle was struck and pushed to the right by a second vehicle which veered her car across the median into the utility pole. 6. The shooting was intentional and the 18-year-old Arquette was the specific target. Police in New Mexico have a long and ongoing track record of murder, bank robbery, kidnapping, extortion, sex crimes, burglary, drug dealing, aggravated battery, auto theft, fraud, brutality, entrapment, the planning and or destruction of evidence, intimidation of witnesses, and above all, the cover-up of crimes committed by police officers. 
the 18 year old Caitlin Arquette was was driving was chased down on Lomos Street and shot twice in the head at a stoplight at the corner of Lomos and John Streets. The 18 year old Kate Arquette survived 20 hours in a coma and died the next year, evening. If you have any info concerning this case, please contact the Albuquerque, New Mexico Police Department. Victim 4. Welcome to Albuquerque, New Mexico, Highway 6. Unsolved homicide. The Wells Fargo Armored Highway 6 murder. Thinking about the myths of time, there is that one unsolved murder that gets lost in the shuffle of everyday life. Every town, road and city has those deep rooted dark secrets and New Mexico Highway 6 is no exception. On August 25th, 1994, it started as a routine day. 28 year old Jeff Ultra was driving a 50 year old, out oh, was driving and 50 year old Chuck Mills was in the passenger seat of a rental van being used by Wells Fargo Armored Company. They made the rounds in Los Lunas before heading out on New Mexico Highway 6. The van was carrying an estimated 100 grand of cash coins and receipts. They were making a routine run to Grants, New Mexico, around 80 miles away to make cash drops and pickups for businesses and banks located in Grants, New Mexico. Highway 6 is a 34-mile long, lonely stretch of road running northwest from Las Lunas, I-25, exit 203, to exit 126 on I-40. At just after 10.30 a.m., near the halfway point to I-40, the rental van driven by Wells Fargo security guards approached a pickup truck with a camper shell parked on the side of the road. The back camper door was in a raised position facing the oncoming van. A barrage of gunfire broke out from inside the camper. A single bullet penetrated the rental van windshield and fatally struck the 28-year-old Elcher. Ultra managed to hit the brakes and slid to a stop before dying. 50-year-old Mills engaged two suspects, suspects with his 38 revolver. Mills had to reload his 38 a couple of times before the two suspects broke contact and fled. Mills, despite being injured from a grazing shot, had stopped a half-assed robbery attempt. By the time the firefight was over, there was 40 shots in exchange, to which 28 of those hit the rental van. Ultra was dead and Mills was wounded. Two suspects realized that Mills was going down without a fight, so they broke off contact and sped away northwest of I-40. All that was left was an unsolved murder forgotten to time. FBI investigators interviewed all employees soon after the incident. No new information came to light. The primary questions that hung over everyone, like a thick black cloud. One, how did the suspects even know that the van was coming down that road at that point in time? Two, did the suspects know it was going to be a rental van and not the normal armored one? Three, did someone within the ranks tell the suspects root details for a cut of the money? Four, did someone at budget rentals tip off the suspects? Five, did the suspects follow Ultra and Mills during the days and weeks leading up to the robbery attempt to establish their routine? There was a red sedan that passed Ultra and Mills several minutes before the shootout. Was it possible that this was the third suspect? There are too many unanswered questions. The only known facts for this attempted robbery is that 28-year-old Jeff Ultra lost his life, victim of homicide, and his death remains unsolved. If you have any info concerning this case, please contact the FBI New Mexico office. Okay, Olivia, is there anything you would like to add to any of these cases? No, just um, shady cops and a lot of pot. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, that's around the country, and you know. Yeah, um, yeah, but it, it just seems like there's police involvement in some of them. You know, oh, crooked yeah. cops. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there's a lot of ways to derail an investigation. It only takes, well, in reality, on something like that, it only really takes one. But right. when you find one, you usually find more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, right. I want to thank Olivia for being on the show tonight. A special thanks to our viewers and listeners for tuning in, for y'all have been so kind. I have a quote for you all. 
Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Winston S. Churchill. Always remember, folks, that if you ever get bored with nothing to do, well, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised at what you might find. That's the end of our MJ podcast. This has been episode 11, part 6 for New Mexico Unsolved Homicide Cold Cases. And we say to all of you, good night from Hudson, Florida. Sitting next to you, but after all I've said, please don't forget.